<laughs> can we record the service anyways? Like. Yep, that's a good idea. And uh, then we can have Bill upload it to YouTube later. Jeremy, is that? I guess that's on you then, is it? Can you record the service? Uh, yeah, it's already recording. All right, very good. Thank you. Welcome everyone. As Tracy's mentioned, uh, we are without Bill today, so we will we will see how this goes, and it may be that we will forbid him from taking any more vacations. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we welcome you all. We acknowledge that as we meet, we are on the land of the First Nations who have stewarded this land long before our ancestors arrived. And so we are grateful to be here. Um, so we have some announcements. CAP Spirit registration is now open. You can check out capspirit.ca. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. We acknowledge that we meet on the Sumas and Matsui First Nations lands, and these two First Nations are part of the Stolo Nation. Thank you. Uh, CAP Spirit registration is now open. You can check out capspirit.ca. There are two blocks of three weeks. The second block is being hosted at Gladwin with uh, collaboration from our cluster churches. If you have skills or passions that you'd like to share with the campers in a physically distanced way, uh, I invite you to contact your ministers to pass that on. We celebrate the 95th anniversary of the formation of the United Church of Canada, which occurred this past week on June 10th. There is a United Against Racism um, webinar, worship, maybe both, I'm not sure, um, at 7 p.m. Eastern. You can find that on the National United Church uh, website <laughs> under events. Finally, we grieve the recent passing of Jean Ramsey, who was a longtime member of Trinity Memorial United Church. Uh, Tracy, do you have announcements? I do. Um... The United Church of Canada is offering an online worship service, United Against Racism. It is um, today at 7 p.m. Eastern, so that would be 4 p.m. our time. It's just one hour. And I've posted the link at the very top of the online chat room that you can click on and it will open up the information for you on the United Church website. Um, it's You can Google United Church of Canada and dig a little under uh, events and webinars and find it there, but Black Lives do matter to the United Church of Canada. We have participated in demonstrations, letters have been written, and statements have been made, and now it is time to worship together as people of faith. So the Black Clergy Network of the United Church of Canada invites the whole church to join virtually for a time of worship, prayer, and reflection to face the issues of anti-Black racism across our country and in our church. In our worship, we will lament, we will hope, and we will be reminded of the need to act against racism. And um, just a reminder that those of you who offered prayers in the chat room, there are prayers of joys and celebrations and prayers of concern that will all be lifted up instead of doing some of those joys and celebrations at announcement time. Like Alder Grove is used to, I'll be lifting those up in the prayers uh, during the chat time because there are some joys as well. And um, just a reminder that offerings can still be mailed in to Sandy Hildebrandt at Alder Grove and our, will be not We'll be considering opening our doors sometime after the summer, but continue to look at our website for updates. And this is my last Sunday, and then I'll be on leave coming back again late July. But I'll be available for pastoral emergencies for the next week or two, but then I'll be away for a few Sundays. Thanks, Tracy. I'm also aware there's an announcement from the um our United Church Earth Stewards group, which I don't have in front of me, so if 
if a member from that wants to maybe enter something in the chat, that would be helpful. All right. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is with St. Andrews and Trinity and Gladwin congregations. Tracy? We light a candle to remember the Christ light of Alder Grove United Church and remember that the light shines within all of us, guiding us and offering us hope amidst all the trials and concerns in our lives and guiding us in Christ's way. Amen. Amen. Christ has ascended to heaven, yet remains in our hearts. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. Hallelujah. We also we also remember We also remember the ways in which our LGBTQ2 plus brothers and sisters have been persecuted and we welcome and value their lives. Folks, before we do the call to worship and prayer of invocation, um, I'm not sure we got all the announcement. One was that you're all invited to our fundraising tree party online. Join us on Sunday, July 5th at 7 p.m. for a very special free event, including guest speakers, videos, and more. You'll learn how, for as little as $20, you can purchase a tree to be planted by the city of Abbotsford to help fight climate change. Donations of any amount are greatly accepted. 
for information. They, the information will be on each of your church's websites very soon. Uh, when in doubt, go to Trinity's website, and uh, you can also go through the SPA website as well. So that was an announcement that uh, we missed, so thank you, Julia, for reminding us of that. Now we move to our call to worship and prayer of invocation, Tim. Thank you, Tracy. <clears throat> Sorry about that. No worries. With what shall we come before our God? God has already told us what is good. Shall we come with gifts and offerings? God wants God us, wants us justice. justice. What does the Lord require of us? God wants us to love kindness. What does the Lord require of us? God wants us to walk humbly with God. Come then, let us worship God. Go ahead, Tracy. Jesus, in a time of confusion, you teach a daring way forward. In the presence of despair, you proclaim good news. In the midst of dis-ease, you bring peace and health. Good shepherd, in this strange and sorry season on this earth, we often feel like sheep without a guide. Come near that we may experience your compassion for your 21st century people. Embody your hope for our pandemic planet. Work for your vision for a world where everyone can breathe. Cast out demons of racism and hatred. Make us into laborers of right relationship. Help us harvest connection and community. Send us out to serve and support the overwhelmed, oppressed, and underloved, the hurting, harassed, and helpless, the tired, troubled, and thrown to the ground. Your way is demanding. The cost of discipleship is high. You ask us to embrace simplicity to go into potentially unwelcoming places, to enter into the midst of wolves. Grant us discernment that we might be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Grant us grace that we might be your faithful disciples. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Our first hymn is number 600 in Voices United, When I Needed a Neighbor.
Do we have any children with us today? I hope we do, because my daughter has given me a very special coin from her toy set to talk about this. I wonder, do any of you have a favorite teacher? Or maybe if you've gone beyond the age when you have official teachers, can you remember a favorite teacher? It's really nice when your teacher is paying attention to you, when you're the focus of attention, when they want to hear about your day, when they want to see your painting, when they want to see how good you are at riding your scooter. But sometimes they need to pay attention to other people. Sometimes they need to pay attention to other students and sometimes it can feel like they pay more attention to other students than to you. Sometimes the other students need more attention. And that can be hard when our favorite teacher isn't paying attention to us. That's what's happening in our Bible story today. Everybody wants Jesus to pay attention to them. Jesus really interesting, he's really nice, everybody loves Jesus. But he's hanging out with the people who sit at the back of the class and make noise. He's hanging out with the unpopular people, the annoying people, and the good people, the kids who always pay attention aren't happy. The Pharisees and the scribes are not happy. I wonder if you were one of the people who's labeled as the bad kids, if you're one of the people who in society are labeled as the problem, I wonder how you would feel if Jesus was paying attention to you. I wonder how it feels to be the scribes of the Pharisees who want Jesus' attention and aren't getting it. You might say, Come on, Jesus, I'm important too. I matter too. You may have seen in the news people saying things like Black Lives Matter. And some people don't like to hear that. They want to say, but I matter too. And that's what is happening. We're paying attention to the people who are hurting and sad. And other people are feeling left out. And hopefully we can understand that some people are the people who need our attention right now. But that's not always easy. Thanks for listening. Let's sing about our God, how our God cares about all of us and is everywhere. Let's sing Like a Rock, number 92 in more voices. <coughs> scripture reading today comes from Luke chapter 15 verses 1 to 10. The parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. 
Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, put on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. The parable of the lost coin. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Take our mouths, O God, and speak through them. Take our minds, O God, and think through them. Take our hearts, O God, and set them on fire. Amen. Today's scripture reading features the scribes and the Pharisees. It's not easy to become a scribe in the first century. To be a scribe means, at a minimum, to be literate. And that is a heavy investment in time and energy in a society where 90 to 95% are not literate and see no need to be so. Then you need to become an expert in both the content and interpretation of the Jewish law as found in the Torah. And then you need to learn the specific and special skills that will land you a position in an aristocrat's household or in the political and religious hierarchy. Scribes have authority over their fellow Jews, have private access to the written laws and levers of power, and undergo extensive training unavailable to their fellow Jews. They are a class apart. <coughs> As for the Pharisees, they move among the common people, but like the scribes, their daily concerns are the law of Moses and its interpretation. As a Pharisee, you know the traditions of your people. You are an authority among them, a resource, an arbiter of community conflicts and of what is proper. As a Pharisee, you are an influential player in the push and pull of the religious, social, and political power of the nation. This requires you to distinguish yourself in your personal righteousness, which includes avoiding association with those too poor, sick, perverse, or careless to do likewise. In short, to be either a scribe or a Pharisee means that you have power and status unavailable to the common person and that you have gained that power and status through a combination of sacrifice, hard work, and privileged access to opportunities. You aren't like the lower classes, those your society defines as sinners. And to some extent, your continued power and status depends on reminding people of that. <coughs> so, how do you react? to Jesus. As a Jew who takes their faith seriously, you have been hoping for a Messiah, for a chosen agent of God to save your people as promised in Ezekiel and Isaiah, a shepherd who will gather God's scattered sheep 
and bring God's scattered people home from the corners of the civilized world. So how do you react to this preacher, who people breathlessly hail as a prophet, mighty in word and deed, and perhaps even the Messiah himself? How do you react to this Messiah who shows no interest in the good people, who has no time for you and your prayers and your studies, but instead hangs out in parties with the dregs of society, the sinners, those who, as a good Jew, you are forbidden to associate with? Do you feel a bit insulted? Do you feel a bit angry and confused? Do you decide he can't be anything special after all? Do you ask, hey Jesus, what about me? Don't all Jews matter to the Messiah? It's not easy to become a white professional in today's 21st century society. I worked hard to get where I am. I did eight years of post-secondary education, moved away from friends and family to go to school, went to the other end of the continent for an internship, did so again for three years of my ministry living in a Newfoundland fishing village. That was quite unlike the major city I grew up in. And where I am, frankly, isn't much compared to the chosen few that our economic system elevates to extravagant wealth and status by exploiting the rest. It's not easy to be white in the 21st century, but it's a hell of a lot harder to be black. It isn't easy to be black when your parents are less likely to have money or good health or good education, when your schools may not be up to the same standards as whites, when dozens of different factors conspire to stack the deck against you in subtle ways. <coughs> It's not easy to be black when you're the first suspect for any crime, when being in the wrong place at the wrong time can mean your death, when whites don't understand that while the police mean safety for them, they mean death for you. It's not easy to be white now that this black reality is more visible. It's not easy to be white when I realize that I'm racist. I'm not racist in a cross-burning, bedsheet-wearing, calling people nigger way. But I'm racist because I live in a racist society. Unlike in the first century, the church doesn't have the clout to designate and segregate some people as righteous and others as sinners. But society does name its winners and losers. And politicians and demagogues are happy to designate sinners those who place an undue burden on society. Sinners are visible minorities and undocumented immigrants, but somehow not the people who refuse to have group homes in their neighborhoods or who conduct business in predatory ways. Often those divisions operate on racial lines. Often those divisions give me as a white man dozens of subtle, unasked for, and often unnoticed advantages. Our society's racism has unspoken rules and assumptions that I ingested as a child, just as the black children of Flint, Michigan, or the indigenous children of Canada's North ingest tainted water. My racism is as inevitable as it is unintentional. And having that pointed out hurts. And in this racist system, which is married to our capitalist system of competition and exploitation, I may correctly fear that restoring status and opportunity to others may mean less for me. And so when black lives rise up and demand an end to white knees crushing black necks, when black lives cry that black lives matter, my instinctive response is, but all lives matter. The illusion of social fairness is critical to the idea that I got where I am completely on my own. So when someone points out that the system isn't fair, that black lives are specifically and uniquely endangered right now, 
I feel threatened. And I try to pull the viewpoint back to a distant and universal perspective that is too far away to see the details. The first rule of Fight Club is that you don't talk about Fight Club. The first rule of racism is that you don't talk about racism. A racist and exploitative society works great for those at the top and okay for those in the middle. But if you start talking about it, you throw a wrench in the gears and somebody gets hurt. Probably you. That is exactly what Jesus is doing when he sits down with the tax collectors and others designated as sinners like someone defying segregation laws. He's drawing attention to the system and saying, what are you gonna do about it? Jesus even makes preachers uncomfortable. I read one sermon about Jesus eating with sinners and the preacher assured his audience <clears throat> that it was okay because they were repentant sinners. No, they weren't. Jesus eats with them. Jesus hangs out with them. Jesus drinks with them. He never scolds them, and they don't repent of being poor. They don't repent of pursuing the dirty, dangerous, ritually unclean jobs, which are open to the poor. When the good people demand to know why he's messing up the system by doing so, he tells them the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. <clears throat> when sheep get separated from the flock, they sit down and bleat. They don't come back to the fold by themselves. When coins are lost, they don't roll themselves back into your purse, like the one ring finding its way back to Mordor. The shepherd doesn't throw a party when the lost sheep comes sheepishly home. No, he goes out and looks for it while it is still lost. The woman looks for the coin because it is lost. And I think that is the point of the parable. We don't earn God's care and attention. And God has no time for the, the divisions that we draw between each other. In fact, God has a special extravagant care for those we name sinners. And that offends us good people because it tears down the narrative that says we got where we are because we deserve it, because we alone worked hard or because God cares about us alone. It's scary, it's offensive, it's incriminating. But there is good news in this parable for us white folks. The one sheep is in danger, but the 99 still belong to the shepherd. The one coin is lost, but the nine still belong to the woman. All lives matter because all lives matter to God. And that cuts both ways. <clears throat> If all lives matter, then when some lives are endangered, we need to focus on those lives in particular. But that does not mean that the other lives cease to matter. So if black lives matter makes you feel like you don't matter, or if the awareness of your complicity in a racist system makes you suddenly aware that you may be the one who is lost, do not be afraid. Because all lives matter, your life matters. And so God is searching for you with the intensity of a shepherd who has lost a sheep. God is searching for you with the intensity of a woman who has lost a coin. Excuse me. It may be that that finding may not be pleasant. It may be that when the shepherd pulls you out of that thorn bush, you get a little cut up. It may be that Jesus is offering salvation to the scribes, to the Pharisees, to us, with a painful lesson and shocking behavior, demonstrating that we are not as central as we thought we were. But never doubt, also, that when God finds us, she will throw a great big party, 
and there will be rejoicing among the angels of heaven at our repentance and salvation. Amen. Our next hymn is number 199 in more voices when at this table. Today in our worship, we recognize people of African descent and lament anti-black racism and violence. We pray that the spirit will reorient us. Challenging us to live by grace rather than entitlement, expecting to us to be, to be a, a blessing, blessing to the earth. earth. We pray that by acknowledging our brokenness, we will be closer to becoming a church where the good news is lived out. Faith nurtured and, and hearts comforted. comforted. Gifts, Gifts shared, shared for the, for the good, good of, of all. all. Resistance to, to the forces that exploit and marginalize. Fierce love in the face of violence. Human, human dignity defended. defended. Members, members of, of a community, community held and inspired, inspired by, by God. Through our tears and silent confessions, may we witness to your love and grace. Let us sing. From More Voices 34, all is done for the glory of God. Verse 1. <laughs>
Tracy's muted. God is our refuge and home. God is our strength and center. God is a very present help. God has always been and always will be our very present help. Amen. 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 As we begin the prayers of the people, we are going to sing Kumbaya. <laughs> Loving Lord, come by us, we pray. Come to the joyful, the excited, the grateful. Come to the scared, the sad. the weary, the grieving. The distraught. The broken. Come to us all, we pray. Kumbaya. those prayers lifted in the chat 
We pray for Jean Ramsey, who passed away as a long-standing member of Trinity. For Joyce's great-grandson's third birthday. Joan prays for her brother-in-law, Ken, whose life is precarious with heart and lung issues, as well as cancer. His name is Ken. William prays a prayer of thanks for his granddad, who plays with him all day. We pray for Irene Hill and her family in Hamilton. Her father is terminally ill. We pray a belated birthday for Arlene Kropp. We pray for Gladys's friend Ellie, who's battling cancer. It's a good friend of hers. Jan prays for her brother Doug and family in Utah and extended family across two countries. Prayers for people suffering oppression due to ethnicity or skin color. Joanne offers prayers for Tina Hines and family on the passing of her mother, Anne Brandes. Prayers for Jean Ramsey's family as she passed away last week, which I mentioned, but several people offered it in prayer, so it's important in our hearts. Prayers of joy for Ethan who turned 11 on Friday. Prayer for Lillian Hildebrandt in hospital. Max offers prayers of celebration for their daughter and new grandson, Edmund. Mina and Linda offer joyous prayers of celebration as Mina turned 97 this week and had a family birthday celebration and it was the first time seeing family. It was a great surprise. Joys of celebration for Lyle and Barb, who celebrated 57 years of anniversary. Happy anniversary to Kate and Byron. Prayers of gratitude from Bonnie for God's grace and healing power after her recent head concussion. She is home from hospital now, but still has frequent bouts, bouts of dizziness. I hope I didn't miss any prayers that were lifted and those that were unsaid we hold in our hearts now. Holy God, you hear our words, you hear our hearts. We are known and heard deeply, graciously, constantly. Confident in this grace, we sing together the words that Jesus taught us from <clears throat> Voices United 959. now acknowledge our gifts for the work of God. Today we send and bring our gifts with hearts filled with love for one another. All we give and all we do is for the glory of our God. And so God, as you treasure, as the widow treasured each coin, 
and especially the ones that she had lost. So you treasure, O oh God, every coin that we bring. Every coin we can spare, every coin we feel we cannot spare. Every corner of our lives that we offer to you. We ask you, God, to use them and to bless them. Amen. Our next hymn is entitled, For Everyone Born, A Place at the Table.
we are sent out. We are sent out into the world God loves. We are sent out into our own hearts to see what is written there, to uproot what doesn't belong, to see the beauty in them. But know that as you go, the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be with us all this day and always. Amen. Sing on me, on me, we praise your name, O God. Sing on me, on me, we praise your name, O God. Sing on me, on me, on me, we praise your name, O God. Sing on me, on me, we praise your name, O God. Sing on me, on me. Thank you.